Well, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, so, um, what I'm going to try and do is just kind of sketch out a kind of like a thought exercise that that responds to the question that I think is there on the program that addresses power as such and tries to theorise power as such, how power is experienced, how power can be encountered and met with and 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 um, and resisted. Um, I can't really remember what the paper was originally called, but but I gave this talk about a month ago in, in Dumfries, um, and there it was called um, Nothing is Taking Place But the Place Itself, Slavoj Žižek's Anxious Anarchism. So that's what I'm going to call it. Um, I'd be absolutely fascinated to hear what people make of Žižek. I don't know how familiar people are with Žižek, but I always thought, like, because um, I'm just coming up to start a PhD, I always thought, like, about six months ago when the time came to start doing conferences and stuff. Um, I wasn't really sure when the conferences started coming how much of a Zizekian I would be, but it's turned out um, that every time one comes along I find myself when I'm given 15 or 20 minutes to speak that it's it's Zizek that I do. Um, so I must be a kind of a Zizekian. So in the discussion after I would be fascinated to hear what people think of the kind of ideas that I'll try and develop. Um, so. For me, Zizek comes up with a really penetrating response to the question, what is power? Um, is it all consuming? Or can it, be, can it be met with? Can it be engaged with? I think that he comes up with some fascinating responses. It's quite hard to develop these ideas, so I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. And I, I, I know a few ways to kind of approach it slowly and, 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 and even for myself, you know, using metaphors and so on. That's, that's you know, with post-structuralist stuff, that's kind of... Sometimes you can only approach these things slowly and we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how the ideas develop and we'll see um, what, what kind of ideas come out of that. Um, the, way, the first way really that I want to approach Zizek is by bringing up um, someone who I would consider maybe Zizek's opposite. Um, I, got, um, I did my MA dissertation on Batman 3. Um, and I, like, it was really good fun, like read with Hegel and stuff like that. My supervisor said, go away and read this guy called Roberto Mangaberia Unger. Now, I don't know where Torsten is, but Torsten might know. Oh, he's not here. But if there's any economist in the room, they might know this guy, Roberto Mangaberia Unger. He's, the idea that I'll bring out as belonging to him is very commonsensical, but just to put a name to it. Um, Unger um, has been, I think still is sometimes, an advisor to Obama. Um, he's made several speculative bids for the Brazilian presidency, um, and he's a very prolific economist and so on. But as I say, the idea that I bring up as belonging to him um, is very commonsensical, and we've all heard it, and I, I hope that you agree. Let me see if I can get this image up. Yeah, that's cool. So the image that's about to come up is from a... Um, from a Weimar Germany uh, piece of cinema called Metropolis by Fritz Lang, I think it was 1927. Um, and the, the basic idea there is that it's a stratified, spatially stratified society where the elite academics and the, the kind of the gentry, if you like, live in this idyllic garden paradise right at the top. The, the workers live in this kind of cavernous, like subterranean, industrial, <coughs> right, like region below, um, and they, they, it, it, life's bad. Um, and the, the, it's a very long film, and th this is the ending, that the, the workers and the gentry manage to, this is a kind of a, a mediating third figure, bringing, the, bringing the, 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 the proletariat, if you like, and the gentry together and making them shake hands. Now this was very resonant in Weimar era Germany when the kind of the German Socialist Party was creeping up in terms of its success and it was a real anxiety about how can we make the different segments of society work together? That can we can we find more that we agree on than we disagree on? And that was a that was a, 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 a profound anxiety for them. Um, to me, Unger, he he so I'll, I'll spell out his basic idea before I before I do the Zizek. So Unger's basic idea is, as I say, a very commonsensical one, that we have all sorts of opportunities to create the kinds of political spaces and temporalities and ideological strains that, that whatever we want to create, we can. You can call it maybe the kind of 
the Disney version of political philosophy, that we just have to try, we have to try our best, that we can engage in political structures, that by adding a, you know, a little bit of ourselves into the mix, we can, we can all together kind of bake the kind of cake that we would want to eat, that, that you just have to try, essentially, that if you don't try, you'll never know. Um, and so it's a kind of an evolutionary response to Marx, you know, that we, we make our history, but not always in the time of our own choosing. He's very much within that tradition of the kind of path dependency thing that society is there to be integrated with. But Unger's response to the question, is power all consuming? Unger's response would be, no, not really. Like, it can be, but if you are clever about engaging with it, um, then it rarely ever is. It rarely ever is as all-consuming as it seems to be. Um, so I'm glad I've rattled through that quite quickly because although I'm aware that that resonates nicely with um, you know, what Michael and Torsten were saying about trade unionism and the, 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 the value of kind of collective bargaining and, 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 and the, the, the value that that can have within the social dynamic. I'm, 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 I'm very much on board with that, but I want to spend this time spelling out the completely opposite view, um, which I think has value even on its own terms, even as, as an intellectual exercise, um, which is which is Zizek's view. Um, so to, to try and get at it, as I said, slowly, a little bit slowly. Um, Zizek does, or you know, in, that, in the book on Hegel, which I don't know if anybody's read, he does a whole chapter on like science, quantum physics, and, and so on. Um, and he kind of paints the picture of the atom, and he says, okay, what is the atom? What, what did quantum physics in the, you know, the 30s discover the atom to be? Um, it's, at, at, at its smallest level of microscopic kind of uh, magnification, um, the atom is essentially mostly a void, that there's, there's actually nothing there, that, that, that it's, it's what he calls less than nothing, um, because the kind of a physical space is actually a, a huge void held together with kind of, you know, charge, like what he calls negative charge, so it's uh, like a, a nothingness that where everything's aligned pointing the same way. So. Developing that a little bit, he has the same he has the same conception for society. Um, he has the same conception for society. So what I'd like to try and do now a little bit, if I can, is draw a line, however difficult, try and draw a line between German idealism two hundred years ago right through to now and 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 and, and Zizek. Um, so I'm going to read a quote in a minute from the Hegel book, the Zizek book on Hegel, which I think is, is fascinating. So hopefully the, the, this kind of image just starts you off that we, we kind of, you know, Nietzsche would have said that we build our societies on the edge of, of volcanoes, that that void that, um, that, 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 that the, the Copenhagen school, um, you know, of quantum mechanics identified at the level of the atom um, is also formally true at a conceptual level socially. Um, that, that our societies essentially gravitate around a nothingness, around the kind of abyss that Casper uh, David Friedrich's Wanderer is gazing into. That essentially we, we all gravitate around. A good way to explain this is through Alain Badiou. So Alain Badiou would say, is, is an election, is an election philosophical? Um, by and large, Alain Badiou would say, no. Philosophy is where you have what, what he calls a non-commensurable relationship between two different social elements. So if you have an election, there, there, there's an implicit agreement there that if one party loses the election, then they'll cede the political space to the, the, the party that's won the election. So what Perdue would say is essentially that the, the disagreement over policies or whatever it might be actually cloaks a fundamental uh, tacit agreement about the rules of the political game, that there really is no kind of non-commensurability there, that everyone can talk to each other, everyone can relate to each other, everyone knows the game. Um, so famously, Badiou hasn't voted since 69 because he, 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 I haven't really read into this, but, but you know, obviously you know there what happened in 68. But you famously hasn't voted since 69. I imagine he would say that he hasn't had a choice since 1969. That, 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 that the, the, what, you, what Heidegger and, and people after him would call the foreclosure of the political space would probably leave Badiou feeling like he has no one to vote for. And, and, and here you have the kind of the cynicism that, 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 that has already been a theme this afternoon um, and that I'm sure we can talk about a lot longer. 
Um, so I'm going to read this, this bit from the Hegel book. I really like it. I hope you do too. So, there's a little bit of jargon in this, which I can develop. We're quite happy to develop, but hopefully it speaks for itself. So, Zizek says the following in the Hegel book. What the inexistence of the big other signals is that every ethical and or moral edifice has to be grounded in an abyssal act, which is, in the most radical sense imaginable, political. Coming back to Badiou a minute, but Badiou would say that, that the true election is not about participation within some kind of commensurable space, but it's a contestation about the space itself, what, what someone like Heidegger might call the ground on which politics is built. So to, to reiterate, it's not negotiation within a conceptual space, it's a negotiation over what that space even entails. And we might think, coming back to Metropolis, we might think about the kind of the messy ground of 20s and 30s European politics is a good example. It's, it's far more bipolarised. We could even think back to Thatcher, maybe. The, 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 the issue seems far more to be about what kind of debate we're even having rather than about pragmatic, technocratic decision-making. Um, so, the idea that one can ground politics in ethics, or that politics is ultimately a strategic effort to realise prior ethical positions, is a version of the illusion of the big other. From the question, which ethics fits psychoanalysis, we should therefore pass to the question, which politics fits psychoanalysis? With regard to politics, Freud's ultimate position is the same as Lacan's. Psychoanalysis, so maybe what I'm tr a little bit of what I'm trying to do here, a kind of psychoanalytic uh, diagnosis of society, what Derrida does. What psychoanalysis does not provide is new positive political programs for action. It, it, it doesn't claim to, formally it can't, it, it, it can't possibly. What it does do, its ultimate achievement, the bottom line of its analysis and, and, and French theory, continental theory, is to have discerned the contours of a negativity, a disruptive force which poses a threat to every stable collective link. Since a political act intervenes in a state of things, simultaneously creating instability and trying to establish a new positive order, one can say that psychoanalysis confronts us with the zero level of politics, a pre-political, transcendental condi condition of possibility of politics, a gap which opens up the space for the political act to intervene in, a gap which is saturated by the political effort to impose a new order. In Lacanian terms, psychoanalysis confronts us with the zero level at which nothing is taking place but the place itself, while politics proper intervenes in this place with a new master signifier, imposing fidelity on it, legitimising us in enforcing on reality the project sustained by this master signifier. I'll go into three models as that throws up, um, centred around this abyss, this formal abyss which grounds the social body itself. So one is what he calls the conservative approach with a, with a, with a small c. Um, so the conservative reaction to the gap is to the abyss that the, that the, that the guy is staring into is to become obsessed with it, to, to, to try and eliminate it, to, to essentially paper over the cracks. Uh, the second model is the, what Zizek calls the liberal uh, model of approach, where we celebrate all the different kind of um, conceptions of the gap and try and mediate between them. Again, a lot like what, um, what, what some of us uh, what were saying a little bit earlier. Um, but the, the third position, and the one that Zizek privileges and the one that I kind of want, want to throw myself behind now, is what he calls the Maoist um, position. Now, it, it's, it does, this, of course, doesn't have to be historically specific to Maoist China. The, he's, he's putting a kind of a label on it just in order for us to be able to identify it and then, um, and then, and then embody it in whatever kind of temporality and space that we, that we, that we find it. Um, but the Maoist conception of the, the, the abyss, which formally constitutes the social body, is that approach which recognises um, and agrees with, maybe, the kind of psychoanalytic point that I've just tried to make, and essentially becomes obsessed with it in a very open way. 
um, and, and fixates upon it. That, that, that here, from here you get Mao's concept of permanent revolution, all the kind of exciting, all the kind of conceptual flourishing that, 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 that Zizek does identify as having happened um, in Maoist China. Um, so when I gave this, when I gave this talk, um, as I say, about a month ago in Scotland, um, I, I, I ended up saying, well, okay, so is power all consuming? Yes. So what do we do then? Um, and, and I think I ended up saying something like, um, you know, I ended up putting a lot of stress on the uh, kind of emphasis that Zizek makes about political silences, that essentially borrowing a lot from Foucault, Zizek borrows that from Foucault, that, 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 that silences can be very, can be very uh, enabling. Um, it, so in terms of that Maoist um, almost embrace of the gap, the celebration of the gap, that, that we essentially, unlike the, the, the kind of the truce makers in the first photo, that we don't try and solve problems, that we essentially fixate, we fixate on how much we, how much we fundamentally disagree. We, um, we, we identify and we carry with us um, what someone before called the kind of the inherent violence of the process, that we recognize that, that social, um, social mediation is not has not ever been and can never be about um, finding a safe ground, that essentially the, the safe middle um, does not exist. Um, I could quite easily talk a lot about you know, Kant and how, there's a, the, the, how the parallax kind of, the middle ground that does not exist is a kind of, it's a negative in our, in our vision, that, that, that there, is a, there is an absence where the safe middle should be. Um, so, as I say, when I gave this talk about a month ago, I ended up stressing, um, you know, that we should we should we should dwell on silences, and we should we should fundamentally not try to solve problems. And I remember that invited a lot of stuff back to me about um, ecology, and people were saying, well, well, that's just that's just arrogant. That's just elitist and arrogant um, because you know we do nothing, we're going we're gonna to suffer all, all forms of consequence, and, and at the time I argued back, but, but yeah, it was pr probably, probably very right. So um, there's, there's, a, there's a good bit that I'll read to you to, to finish off with um, in a, the, another book that Zizek wrote in, in 2012 called The Year of Dreaming Dangerously, where he manages to take the kind of psychoanalytic point that I've just tried to make about society and manages to uh, condense it into maybe a few conceptual um, innovations about political praxis and the way to navigate the all-consuming nature of power uh, and the way that the chain of signification works. So I'll find the book and I'll read this to finish it off. Okay. Um, so Zizek says, we should turn around the usual historicist perspective of understanding an event through its context and genesis. Radical emancipatory outbursts cannot be understood in this way. Instead of analyzing them as part of the continuum of past and present, we should bring in the perspective of the future, taking them as limited, distorted, sometimes even perverted fragments of a utopian future that lies dormant in the present as its hidden potential. According to Deleuze, in Proust, people and things occupy a place in time which is incommensurable with the one they have in space. The famous Madeleine is here in place, but this is not its true time. So we're all sitting here today, we, for Heidegger, Heidegger would say that the possible ranks much, much higher than the actual, that there are links through temporality and space that are, that are working in very mysterious ways. So, so the, the, the upshot of this is that dwelling on the kind of the, the, the formal constitutive gap that structures the way that we relate to each other socially can 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 bring a new a new kind of bravery really that, that we we have to be prepared I think you know I would I'll put myself behind what Cullen was saying earlier that we, we, we have to be quite happy with division and we have to be quite happy with putting ourselves in situations where we know it's not exactly going to be a picnic because that is, that is all that will ever work. Um, 
So Zizek has got quite a nice one about people tend to say um, if you want to make an omelet, uh, you have to break some eggs. Um, so Zizek said, well, what would Hegel say about that? Hegel would say that it's the leap that comes first, right? It's the jump that comes first that constitutes where you're going to land. Um, so for Hegel, Hegel would say that if you want to break some eggs, in the end you have to you have to make some omelets. That it's the it's the egg breaking, not the omelet making that counts. It's the it's the chaos. It's the destruction. Now this probably sounds like you know the same student stuff that that but but I, I really I really believe in it. I think it's I think it's a very interesting way to think about it. That dwelling on this uh, this nothingness, if you like, can inspire us to different kinds of political bravery that don't have to end in programmatic um, bullet point programs, that don't have to end in five year plans, that they can end in the creation of temporal and spatial places um, where someone like Rothko would say that we, we all have to find these pockets of silence where we can root and grow. And he said, uh, we all have to hope that we find them. Um, so that's it. Um, I'd really like to hear what you guys think about, about, about Zizek and the kind of things that I've, uh, I've been developing. Uh, thanks very much.